Mystery on Mackinac Island, Chapter 2. It's called Those Monoculars. Here's the picture of the page. Under the tall trees, Grandfather's cabin seemed dark when Hunter entered. entered. After lighting a kerosene lamp, he made a quick fire in the wood stove and soon had a hamburger sizzling there. He got out a bag of chips and had just finished eating his supper when there were footsteps on the porch and a knock at the door. Thinking it must be his dad, he opened the door. Instead of his father's short figure, he saw a tall, muscular shape of Kirby Tyson, the island's trash collector. He lived next door to Dad in the village, and Hunter's heart skipped a beat. He wondered if something was wrong with his dad. Hi, Hunter, the man said. I couldn't get to the cemetery this morning, but I'm sorry about your grandpa. I wanted to see if there was any way I could help. Thanks, the boy answered. I'm okay. Kirby stepped in and looked around. You've got a nice place here. Bet you'll be glad to move. I'm not moving, Hunter told him. Kirby looked surprised. Why not? As Hunter was slow in answering, he added, I bet you didn't know how to get your furniture and stuff to the village. I'll give you a hand. We can load the trash wagon and get most of it out in one load. It's waiting at the end of the trail. Thanks, Hunter repeated, but I'm going to get a job and take care of myself here until school starts. I'm sorry to hear that, Kirby answered. Your dad told me he was hoping you could earn some money and help the family. His work at the stable, stop, stable stops, you know, after Labor Day. I know, Hunter mumbled. He said I could try this. Kirby was silent for a minute as his eyes wandered around the room. He noticed an owl headdress hanging on the wall, and he noticed other items of Indian handicraft on the shelf. Have you thought, he questioned, that if you are away all day working, someone might break in and steal your things? Who would do that, Hunter asked, upset at the idea of his Indian treasures being stolen. Eh, tourists or teenagers? Looking for free souvenirs, Kirby answered. If they were in your dad's house, they would be safer. Yeah, safe for thieves, Hunter agreed, but Bella's kids would wreck them in a week. Again, Kirby was quiet and thinking. At last, he said, face it, Hunter. All kids at your age, all you can do is get some odd jobs, and those are hard to find. But sometimes when I'm collecting trash, people ask if I know anyone who could do jobs for them. So I'd let you know, but I can't if you're way out here. If you live next door to me in your dad's house, I could help you pick up some extra bucks. Hunter shook his head slowly. Thanks, but I want to stay here. That's too bad, Kirby responded. I really wanted to help you get back to civilization. But you see, Hunter explained, I don't like that civilization. Okay, okay, Kirby said, moving toward the door. But when you change your mind, I'll be glad to move you for free. When Kirby had disappeared down the trail, Hunter's feelings were mixed. It was good of Dad's neighbor to want to help him, but the teenager could not bear the thought of living in the village. Today, he had learned how hard it would be to earn money, even just for food, but he was still going to give it a shot. Thinking of food, he realized he was hungry. He looked for a piece of fruit, but there was none. In fact, there was very little food of any kind left. Tomorrow, he would have to make buy more, and he would use whatever was left of Grandfather's money. Opening the drawer to where the money was kept, he felt around and found his fingers came up empty. Then he remembered he had used the last $5 bill to buy medicine for father, for grandfather. So what should he do now? He couldn't help ask his father. His teacher, Mr. Clemson, who was always ready to help kids, but Hunter didn't feel like he should ask him. And suddenly loneliness swept over him. The longing for his grandfather was a sharp thorn in his chest. The old man's worn moccasins were on the floor by his sturdy wooden chair. After a moment's thought, Hunter sat in the chair for the first time in his life. He kicked off his loafers and slid his feet into the moccasins. It gave him a sense of oneness with his grandfather to wear his shoes and sit in his chair. Maybe if he sat there quietly, some of grandfather's wisdom would come flowing through. Hunter was keen to lay plans for tracking the bicycle thief, but first he needed to earn some money for food. After a while, an idea came to him. In the morning, he would go to the West Bluff and ask for work at the big houses of the summer residence. As soon as he had laid in some food, he would get on with the mystery of the disappearing bicycles. The first step in that project, he decided, would be to stake out Sugarloaf. More bikes had vanished from there than anywhere else, and bushes gave good cover where he could hide from the thief. When tourists left their rented bikes to climb around on the unusual rock formation, Hunter would be watching to see if the thief came along and rode off on one of them. 
Hunter would follow him at a distance and see where, where he hid the bike. His last thought before falling asleep was how surprised his dad would be when Hunter showed him 50 bucks, maybe even a hundred. The next morning, Hunter was up with the sun, too early to ask for work, but perfect for watching for birds. He went to an old cedar tree near the house and drew from a leaf-filled hole at its base a plastic sack containing a pair of powerful binoculars. Putting the strap around his neck, he was off through the woods, lost in his own world. Two hours later, he returned, with more facts in his notebook about the call of a warbler. As he kneeled by the cedar tree, it struck him that there was no need to hide the binoculars. Grandfather would not be here to ask where he got them. He took the glasses into the cabin and put them in a knapsack he would carry downtown. On the West Bluff Road, Hunter went from house to house where the summer residents were living. He offered to mow their lawns, work in the garden, make repairs or paint. He could cut and haul wood, but today no one needed his help. It was really discouraging. By the time the sun was high overhead, Hunter knew there was only one thing left to try. He would have to go to the ferry docks and pick up a few quarters by carrying bags for passengers. He shrank from that because it meant talking to the tourists, strange people the islanders called fudgies because they ate so much of the famous Mackinac fudge. Before tackling that unpleasant job, Hunter took a break. He went out to the rocky bluff called Pontiac's Lookout. Far below, the lake was sparkling blue and gold in the sunshine. In the distance stretched the Miracle Bridge, the Mighty Mac, spanning miles of lake from Mackinac City in the south to St. Ignace in the north. At first, the sky was empty, and then he saw a tiny speck of blueness in the south. Quickly, he pulled out his glasses and focused them, hoping to spot an eagle. But no luck. It was just an airplane headed for the Petoskey Airport. Looking closer to the island shore, he saw a ferry from St. Ignace chugging along, followed by a ballet of gulls. He watched them through the glasses, enjoying their grace and their skill. He never, they never even touched each other as they whirled and swirled around the moving boat. He looked at the passengers. They seemed close enough to touch. He saw a red-haired boy, about 12 or 13, standing on the deck, looking at the island through the binoculars. Hunter studied him. He was a typical mainland kid. Blue denim shorts, a yellow tee covered with a cartoon character on it. Very white skin and freckles. With a jolt, the island boy suddenly realized that the tourist boy had binoculars trained on him. The red-headed red -headed boy gave him a friendly wave and Hunter raised his arm in a salute that he used to give grandfather. Instantly, he dropped down out of sight behind the low bush, angry with himself. What did he think he was doing, signaling friendship with a fudgy kid? When the ferry was out of sight, he rode down the hill, parked his bike behind the library, and checked the window. No cedar waxwing. Good. He would see Mrs. Purcell later. First, there were those quarters he needed to desperately earn. He reached the nearest dock just as the passengers from Mackinac City were pushing their way ashore. The St. Ignace boat was unloading at a farther dock. Among the casually clad, gum-chewing strangers, Hunter saw a woman dressed in a creamy white pantsuit. Her silvery hair was in perfect places, and her eyes searched the dock anxiously. She spoke to a girl who was standing by a pile of matched luggage, and then walked around the ramp to the dock. She glanced around uncertainly. Hunter thought if he could help her, she might pay well. As he stepped in front of her, she almost bumped into him. "'Well, can't you look where you're going?' she exclaimed. "'I'm sorry,' Hunter said, but can I help you?' The lady looked down her nose at him. How can I get to East Bluff with my luggage? Can I get you a taxi? He asked. The woman's blue eyes opened wide. A taxi? I understood that only the only cars on the island were emergency vehicles. Oh, there are still plenty of taxis, Hunter assured her. I'll carry your bags to the street and get one for you. The tall girl left to guard the suitcases, looked friendly, with light brown hair fluffy around her face. Hunter thought she might be about his age until she grinned at him, showing metal bands on her teeth. She was younger than he was, maybe 11 or 12. He picked up the bags, surprised because some of them seemed empty. Leading the way to the street, he signaled to the taxi stand. As the brightly painted horse-drawn Surrey pulled up in front of them, the lady's mouth dropped open. This is a taxi, she gasped. Keeping his face straight, Hunter pointed to the sign, taxi, on the roof. 
The man was an old man, and he was having trouble with his bony, restless horses. He told Hunter to pile the bags in the rack behind the seats. The girl climbed in, followed by the woman, who turned and opened her purse. She hesitated, and Hunter was afraid she was going to ask how much. Instead, she snapped her purse shut and said, You had better come along with us to carry our things into the house. When Hunter had seated himself beside the driver, the woman asked, Do you know where the Cragmore house is? Yes, ma'am, he answered as he clucked to the horses. On the east bluff, yellow house with a red door. Nobody's been there for years. It's good you're moving in.